This episode of the Troxel Podcast is made possible with support from Arc IT. Are you tired of standard IT services that miss the mark? Choose Arc IT for specialized, proactive IT management, BIM support, and robust data security tailored for architects. Whether you're a team of 10 or a growing firm of 50 plus, Arc IT understands the architecture industry and will empower your unique creative vision to enable you to do your best work. Embrace a technology team that enhances, not hinders, your design process. Visit getarcit.com for your free IT assessment and start transforming your firm and your tech experience today. That's G-E-T-A-R-C-H-I-T dot com. Welcome back to the Troxel Podcast. I'm Evan Troxel. And once again, if you are a regular listener and are enjoying these episodes, please subscribe on both YouTube and in your preferred podcast app to let me know that you're a fan of the show. Being a subscriber, which is completely free, directly influences two things, which are my ability to attract sponsors that help keep the show going and my ability to attract high-profile guests, which is great for you and our industry. So if you haven't subscribed, I encourage you to do so. As I mentioned, it's free, and it's a great way to support what I'm doing here. Your support is incredibly valuable for the sustainability of the show, and I deeply appreciate it. In this episode, I welcome Kian Walmsley. Kian is a software architect and senior manager focused on the research area of human-centric building design. In this episode, we discuss Kian's background both in computing and his career journey at Autodesk, where he's a well-known figure because of, well, his work there, and because of his long-running blog at kianw.com and his talks and contributions at various AEC tech conferences, including Autodesk University, where I recently caught up with him. We also talk about the development and applications of the VASA toolkit for Dynamo, the impact of AR and XR in the AEC industry, the significance of real-time feedback during the design process, and so much more. Of course, this was a fantastic conversation with Kian, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. And so now, without further ado, I bring you Kian Walmsley. I'm joined today by Kian Walmsley, and I am very happy to have you on the show. And I've been following you for a long time. I, stalking, lurking, I don't know what the right word is, but uh, you have a great blog, and obviously you've been with Autodesk for, for quite a while. And you just recently attended the hackathon that happened in, in Zurich. Maybe before we jump into your story, how was that for you? And, and what, what kind of things did you see there? Yeah, I mean, it was fun. I, I always loved the AC Hackathon events. You know, it's just amazing to see people come together and trying to solve the, the industry problems. Um, I I was only really there on the Friday. Um, I already had a kind of personal commitments during the weekend. So I just came in for the Friday talks. It were mostly around open source technologies um, and then the kickoff of, mm -hmm. of the hackathon itself. Uh, but I found it very interesting. It was really a, you know, I'd actually was kind of surprised at the number of people that I knew there and had the chance to catch up with some sort of unexpected folk uh, that I'd that I've met over the years um, and also some people that I've been in contact with but had never met in person so it was very good yeah but you yes. know short and sweet I was only you know I was only there for well I was there for five hours or something but still it was not for the full weekend it's great that you're just close to that. I mean, that that's the the limiting factor, I think, so often for hackathons, right, it, is that because they are so great in person, you, you want to be collaborating closely with your teammates on the hacks. And I mean, remote is one thing when it comes to that. But but you being within a couple of hours of Zurich is is incredible. And reading your bio, you've been all over the world, it sounds like. And so I'm really interested in your story. And I know you, you're in Switzerland now, correct? And we saw yeah. each other in Vegas at AU. Uh, and and so, so you're traveling a lot, maybe, but, but you've also been all over the place with, with what you've been working on and your trajectory. So maybe take us back, tell us a story about what, that's, what your experience has been. Yeah, no, for sure. I'd be happy to. Um, I don't, you know, just to say though, I don't travel as much as I used to now, which is quite nice. I, my, you know, I think COVID was good for that in the sense that yeah, it, settling things down. Yeah. And then it's <laughs> Take, picked up, it's right. certainly picked up of course since then, but it's mm -hmm. not 
not as not as bad as it was before. Um, but yeah, so my background, I mean, going back far enough, I mean, yeah, maybe we go all the way back, but I mean, I, I, growing up, I was always interested in computers and, you know, so this was in, in the, you know, I I was born in the, the, well, I can suppose we can say mid seventies, but early to mid seventies, um, you know, first computers, actually first computer was a TRS-80 model three, um, but also had the, the more sort of, uh, entertainment focused, you know, home PCs, you know, ZX Spectrum, et cetera. Um, yeah, just fascinated by computing technology from an early age. You know, I used to, and actually, you know, the, the memory that I have that kind of maybe does I think back to, which sort of, I can see how my early career sort of fed from that in some way was, was like typing in lots of programs from magazines right because that was just yeah. the, the, the copy and, and line for line yeah. line you know ca- character by character etc right. and there was but there was a bug in one that i you know that that i i debugged and it was like this moment where i was like wow nice. i wasn't yet coding but i would like <laughs> figured out but you how, figured what it wasn't out. working and that was like this kind of aha moment where i was like you know this is this was really interesting right and then I, I just want to pause yeah. because this is such a fun piece of of your history. I, my I started with the Apple II E. We had Apple IIs and Apple threes in school, right? But it, my dad got an Apple II E and and learning kind of basic programming. And he would he was going through the process of learning it, and he would show me. And I wasn't very interested. I, I was interested, but I wasn't actually doing it. You know, print screen go to line. You know, and and just. It was really, really simple stuff. And then I ended up buying my own computer, which was a Commodore 64, and I bought it at Toys R Us, right? Like, <laughs> that's where they sold the Commodore. That was one of the, the outlets because back then, computer stores were, there maybe was like Newegg computers. Right. I don't think there was, there wasn't many options back then, right? I'm not even sure where he bought the Apple IIe, but it was it was like you getting a book on programming games, copying it character by character and hoping you didn't mess something up. And if you did, it was like, oh man, now I have to forensically go back. And I don't know if it's too different than programming today still, but obviously GPT Copilot and things have really changed the game when it comes to <laughs> writing code. But uh, anyway, that that was a, a fun aside because you when you, you're talking about Atari and, and it's just like, it just brought me back because uh, that's that's that was our... That's when we came up, came through, started our journey on computing. I mean, it was well, exactly. it was formative. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, it's a, it's interesting because even that is, you know, I mean, talk about Copilot and things like that. But just like being able to copy and paste text into, right. you know, from one Take environment into another was huge. Instead yeah. of like, I mean, so you know, I talk a bit about that as my my first job in an engineering office that which is kind of interesting which i'll come back to but actually on the on the commodore 64 side of things um that was an awesome machine i never had one growing up but um i did kind of discover them a bit during covid in the sense i i went online on on the swiss version of ebay and uh, and i managed to pick up a commodore 64 with 300 floppy disks okay. um nice. and and a functioning floppy drive and so what i and one the of the drive things is i did enormous right the well, floppy drive is uh, <laughs> Some well, it wasn't like a proper like whatever eight inch. It okay. was like five and a quarter, but it was deep. It was big. For yes, sure. yes, that's yeah, what yeah, I mean. Yeah. It was like a yeah. shoebox size. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and it was a five and a quarter floppy, but it was an enormous physical space. It was like almost as big as the Commodore itself, yeah. right? I mean, just going in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so actually, I, I ended up doing a, a a little YouTube series on my on on my channel called Floppy Fridays, where basically every Friday. I'd take some random floppy disks and try and load them and see what happened. And a lot see of them were kind of hit or miss, but it kept me, you know, we, we did, I did 64 episodes during, during the pandemic, you know, cause it nice. felt like a good number. Right. So, and it was a little, and it was every Friday, including, you know, the holidays. So it was literally, um, yeah, uh, 52 plus the, the remaining 12. Nice. Um, but yeah, by the time I, I was done, I, you know, it was, I'd learned a lot about, the 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 platform called the Commodore sixty four platform and it really had a lot of fun but yeah that might be something to to look at when you have a a few um you know boring bored moments um but yeah my first job in an engineering office was um 
when I was, I guess I must have been 15 or 16, but around that age, I was still at school and they needed somebody and they were paying, they, you know, took a bit, you know, they're paying two pounds an hour or maybe it's four pounds an hour, but it was like a small amount of money. Uh, you know, back then it was, it seemed huge. Um, it was everything, right? <laughs> well, it was, it was freedom. <laughs> Um, right. <laughs> but then can you put a price on that? But it was, um, my first job was to actually take, uh, old, um, engineering calculation programs that were running on a pet machine and type them in, into a PC because they just got a number of three, eight, sixes, oh, two, eight, sixes actually then. Uh, and they wanted to effectively transfer these basic programs from the, from pet basic into GW basic. So it was a very modest amount of rework needed but basically it was just data entry it was just typing um but yeah it was it that was actually fun because within that drawing office then they got AutoCAD so they got three seats of AutoCAD and they realized that they couldn't really do what they wanted to out of the box with it so they had me you know take a look at the Autolist manual and figure out how I could actually create some customizations for the drawing office um, to make them more efficient. You know, it was, it was a plastic man, plastic vessel manufacturer that was okay. uh, effectively creating, pre, you know, pressure vessels, etc. So there was a lot of, you know, 2D plans, elevations of, of nozzles and flanges and things like that. So, you know, to go in and essentially clip yeah. um, the nozzle so that it would... Uh, you know, join appropriately the the point on the you know on 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 the roof of this of this vessel, etc. So yeah, it was really kind of there's a lot of geometry, uh, you know, a lot of you know fun problems figuring out how to do that stuff in Autolisp. Um, they ended up getting a third party or you know an independent package in addition to AutoCAD that would do 2D. Um, 2D constraints and yeah, so that was around, that was a product called Dimension N. So it was an early, um, you know, geometric package that allowed you to set up uh, an overall drawing and then, you know, configure it. And I was really kind of pushing the boundaries on that package. I was constantly on the phone with the, the folks um, over in Peterborough. So this is about, you know, 35, 40 miles away from where I, where I grew up. Um, you know, trying to figure out whether what I was doing was the right way to do things and how I could, yeah. you know, you know, and, and that actually led over time to me getting a job for them as well. So I went in still, while still at university, I was studying computer science at university at the time. And I went in and helped document um, one of their, uh, the packages that they were developing. Um, I also got to, that was actually my first trip to Switzerland for them. I went to the Swiss railways to demo um, some software for the Swiss railways in Lausanne. Um, so that was actually really fun to do that even as a student still, uh, yeah. you know, and speaking French for them as well, which was also pretty wild to think about back then. Um, because when I was studying, I, I, I guess, you know, in a, in a nutshell, my interests as a young man were to really to with computers and speaking French. So in, in the UK, we have A-levels. So we, you know, I think it's still now, um, but we sort of filter down to a very small set of subjects, even at the age of 16, right? Um, so I was doing computer science, maths, and French at that point from 16 to 18. And when I went to university, I chose the university really based on the ability to do an exchange year in France, um, as part of the program. Wow. So nice. that was always my goal was to work for a software company in a French speaking country, which I always thought was France at the time, because, yeah. you know, why not? Um, but then I discovered Switzerland and I realized that actually French speaking Switzerland is, is, was the place for me. Um, wow. How cool. Yeah. How cool. So, so then, <laughs> and yeah, and it was really fun because then while I was still at university, I mean, I was applying for jobs all over the place and it wasn't that I wanted to go into the CAD industry at all. I mean, I'd had some experience, uh, low, relatively low level experience with, with AutoCAD and with other, other packages, but I was, you know, applying for any sort of computing related job, even some management consulting jobs. I mean, my life would be very different if I'd got one of those. 
Um, but I ended up, um, yeah, I ended up getting a, an email in my fourth, well, I was in my fourth year, so wrapping up my, my, uh, studies in the UK and it was my future boss who mess, you know, emailed me and said, well, I was just speaking to your former boss at this smaller software company. I'm building a team that is, um, going to be essentially a European developer support team. So we would, uh, you know, the, the, the people in the team would be answering technical problems. So talking back to the debugging, you know, magazine listings, but also, um, you know, giving training around our programming interfaces, speaking at conferences and seminars and, um, you know, so there'd be quite a lot of travel, quite a lot of interaction with people. And by that point, I kind of realized that my destiny was not necessarily to be a heads down coder, just mm -hmm. doing, um, mm -hmm. development on one feature or even one particular area, um, that I wanted more variety. And I also wanted that human connection. Um, so I was like, sign me up. When can I start kind of thing? Well, you know, obviously then had to go for an interview. And my first round interview was in the UK in our Guilf in our office in Guildford at the time. So this would have been in July of June or July of 1995. But the second round interview was in Switzerland because that's where he was based. And, mm. and he told me, um, you know, when we were talking about logistics, he said, don't bring a big suitcase. And I said, okay, well, I'm only coming overnight, but I won't. And sure enough, you know, it's because he picked me up from the train station in his little Miata sports car and didn't really have space for me to, to put a big, um, bag in the trunk. <laughs> he drove me down, uh, to the Bolak hotel, which is on the, on the lake front. And, you know, and, and that first night <clears throat> before the interview, I was kind of left to my own devices. And I remember walking down, um, by the lake, kind of all nervous, nervous energy and I just sat there and saw this kind of, uh, dry, uh, thunderstorm over the Alps, the other side of the lake. And I just said, oh, you know, this is, this is where I want yeah. to be. Um, and so I, I, I got the job in the, U in the UK originally. I mean, so the job was in the UK, despite the fact that by that point I decided I wanted to be in Switzerland and it took me maybe two and a half years or two years to convince my boss <clears throat> that he'd be better off you know, moving me across to Switzerland. Um, He'd be better off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe that's You'd maybe that's a, a, You would be a better employee if you were there. Well, that's right. Well, anyway, yeah. I was, I was really pushing hard. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and that's what happened. I moved to, to Switzerland in, in March, uh, February, March of 1998. And I thought that would probably be it. But then at some point along my journey, um, and by this point, I would, I'd switched across to use some slightly different product, you know, working with different products. So originally when I joined Autodesk, it was to support a uh, work center, which was a document management product, which look, which at the time looks a lot like vault does today. So you can think about mm. vault as being a, a okay. sort of a, a interesting, very different product, but it has yeah. very similar principles to work center. So I was supporting mm. the API to work, to work center. Um, and then I sort of was working with AutoCAD as well, but over the years I ended up doing JS software doing a lot of work with architectural desktop, um, which is my first kind of exposure to, um, AEC software, I suppose, other than AutoCAD. Right. Um, and so, yes, by, so then I was, I was working in, in Switzerland, um, enjoying that a lot. And then the, an opportunity came up in the team, the same team as the European team, but in the Americas and actually the manager of the Americas team, uh, was leaving. So I was asked to, you know, would I be interested in applying? And so I did along with a few other folks and I ended up, um, getting the position and then, um, yeah, meeting my girlfriend around the same time, which was strange timing. So this, she, she was also working for Autodesk. Um, uh, she was a student working for Autodesk as a, as a temp job type thing. Uh, we met and started going out. And at some point I said, well, I've got this job in the U S I know we haven't been together very long, but do you want to come? Um, and so she was like, yeah, sure. Let's try. And so she just came with a one backpack ready to leave at any moment. Should things not work out? 
and we kind of moved across together. <laughs> Travel um, light so you could escape. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you need. Right. Because <laughs> you never know. Anyway, so that was early in our relationship relatively. And it was also a very interesting time to move to the US mm. um, because it was in the, so it was in, in 2000 in, must have been in, in the late summer. Yeah. Towards the end, September, October time, actually in in year 2000, which you will remember very well as the time that George W. Bush got, had just won the election. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of very interesting time to move to the Bay Area in particular. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it was also the tail end of the dot-com boom. So hiring was, was a disaster. You know, I yeah. had to build this team. Um, or rebuild this team from people who'd left, et cetera. And so recruiting was really challenging, uh, which was my first taste of, of that particular uh, challenge overall. And it was, and, and it set me in good stead for later years, but it was, it was not easy. And then September the 11th happened, of course. Yeah. Um, and yeah, things for us went very strange, especially being French speakers, even though I'm not, it's not my first language. It is my wife's first language. She's also fluent in English, and we're mostly speaking in English. But, but the the sort of the, I don't know if you remember you will remember the whole sort of freedom fries thing. Yeah, that's right. Yep, and, yep, I remember. Right, the whole, and and it's not like we necessarily felt this sort of you know less welcome in the Bay Area. Yeah, but it mm -hmm. was a strange time to be in the U.S. Generally, I would say. Yeah, and it kind of made us realize that for us, it wasn't the place that we wanted to start a family. Um, mm. So we, we did get married in the US um, in November of 2001. So not long after 9-11, uh, after um, but at, actually at Autodesk University. So the, just a few days before, in fact, because we were going to be okay. there anyway um, yeah. for AU 2001. And, and yeah, was we that? got was that married. In Vegas? Yeah, we got married in Vegas by Elvis. All right, uh, which by for Elvis. us, which is which for us is 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 cute and kitsch. Whereas I, th I know I think for most Americans it's a little trashy. But what's funny is you're like I don't I don't think that the U.S. is the place for us to start the family. But we're doing this wedding thing with Elvis. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, this it's, it's yeah. I know that when you say it like that, it does seem yeah. a little bit incongruent. I get it. <laughs> I love it. But, it's a good story, man. <laughs> but it's just it's just how it happened. Anyway, so we got married. Um, and then at that point, uh, you know, I was kind of putting out the feelers within Autodesk to see whether um, whether there are opportunities else w w inside the company that I could, you know, take you know move into, but but back in Europe, effectively. Mm -hmm. So at the, and and so. I was really happy that somebody in our consulting division sort of came to me and said, oh, you know, I heard you're looking to move back to Europe. Um, and he was like the head of the European consulting team. So I thought, okay, it's perfect. I'm going to get a job in Europe. No problem. He actually said, well, um, the good news is I've got an opportunity for you that less good news, depending on where you want to be, is that I've now got a global role and I'd really like you to go to India to set up a development team for my organization. Wow. Wow. And well, it is, you know, it came as a little bit of a surprise. Um, but at the same time, you know, I said, well, where in India? And he says, oh, Bangalore. And I said, well, you know, my mom is actually from Bangalore. I had family in Bangalore, like my grandmother and uncles and aunts. Incredible. Um, yeah. So I was like, you know what? So I talked about it with my wife and they said, well, you know, if you go for two years, normally with these kind of deals, first of all, it's an expat deal. So the, the money was attractive. It was actually more than I was getting in the U.S., and the costs would be lower, of course. Um, but they also said, norm normally they'd move me back to the US afterwards. That would be the deal. But I sort of said, well, if you change it so that you can move me anywhere in the world afterwards, with no guarantee of a job, but just to, 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 to relocate me, then yeah, okay, maybe we can talk more about it. Because our intention mm -hmm. is not to come back to the US afterwards. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that's how that kind of how it went down. We, we ended up going to Bangalore in I think October of 2003 is when we moved pretty much. And so there I was 
helping set up a team that could deliver consulting projects for Autodesk Worldwide from India. Um, so this was kind of the early days of um, IT offshoring, I suppose. Um, mm. You know, there was that, that that kind of wave that was hitting. There's a big boom around mm -hmm. right. hiring people in much the same way as hiring people in the Bay Area uh, had been challenging. Hiring people in Bangalore at that time was super challenging. Um, so that was really quite interesting as well. Just because there um, was so much demand at that time. I mean, same thing with the dot-com boom. You didn't say bust, you said boom, right? So I assume yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a supply and demand issue where, where talent is going to the highest bidder. And yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Exactly. So it was really that. It was like you just, and nobody wanted to come and work for a but well, at least in the Bay Area at the time, like nobody wanted to go and work for a bricks and mortar software company that was mm. founded in the eighties. Everybody they wanted, wanted an to internet go into, company and yeah, yeah. pets.com or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know, whatever the thing was at the time. Um right. <clears throat> so, you know, in India it's slightly different. I mean Autodesk remained a reasonably attractive um you know, uh target for people who are looking to 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 get a job, but it not but at the same, not really, because it was also quite a um, flat sort of hierarchy within Autodesk. It's always been that way in many ways. And one of the things that we found um, with people coming, wanting to, to, to do a job, or, you know, work for an employer, a multinational employer, they were looking for much more hierarchy and the ability to progress, uh, you know, regularly yeah. have a job change or, you know, title change, which is not necessarily what's important or was what's important inside Autodesk. It's not really bad at all. It's really about, you know, yes, you look at compensation, you look at the work you're doing, but you don't really look at the title that somebody's given you. But so that's where we had to adapt a little bit to the local market and sort of find ways to sort of be attractive as an employer to, to people who wanted to come to us. Um, the other kind of wrinkle to that whole story in many ways is that we um, arrived in India and found the, found out that we were expecting our first child. So my wife was pregnant um, and I just signed a two-year contract to do this job. And we we're like, well, what do we do? Do we go back to the UK? Well, go back to go, go somewhere else, go back to Switzerland, go to the UK, whatever. Um, or do we sort of stay and go all in and have the baby mm -hmm. in India? And I kind of said, well, if you want to have the baby in Europe, we, you know, we can certainly go back and do that. But um, I did feel this, you know, commitment. I'd made a commitment for two years and I said, well, I can come back regularly, but I, we won't be together all the time. That's just, you know, that's not realistic. I can't, at the time, there's no way I could have done, done the job from Europe. I really needed to be there in Bangalore. So we made the decision to look for an apartment that was really close to the office within walking distance. So they didn't have to deal with, you know, I could come back really quickly if I needed to. Um, you know, we looked at hospitals and found one that, that worked for us and yeah, decided to have the baby in India, which was, mm. which was kind of a big deal. Um, and yeah, it was, I mean, I had local support of course with family, so it, that helped as well but it was uh it was still kind of a challenging period yeah, yeah. wow <laughs> yeah i mean it, was... it just sounds like it's going all over the place like you you literally don't know where you're going to be in two years because of this you, you've bounced around already so much in the story it's it's incredible yeah i had a clue though i mean i knew i wanted to go back to switzerland afterwards really yeah you sent so another email was... to it <laughs> to your boss and <laughs> there you go. <laughs> By that point, he'd left, so it was a different well, a different boss at that point. But I was, boss, I was kind of yeah. lucky in the sense. Well, that's also the good thing about being on a, a time limited kind of engagement like that is yeah. you can set set an expectation of what your intentions are and look for opportunities right. back in back in Europe. So I, at the time, then was able to sort of, yeah, kind of figure out what the next move would be, and then by the time. I was about to finish the two years. I'd, I was kind of in a global role at that point because there was, there'd been a restructuring and I was, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was in our developer network organization. We'd actually 
I'd actually been part of that all the way through, but we'd been, it was a bit complicated, but we were part of consulting for a time. And so while, you know, the team I had was working on consulting projects, they were also providing developer support. So there was still that kind of continuity. Um, but yeah, so my boss, so, and you may have come across Jim Quancy over the years anyway. No, maybe not. I okay. Haven't. Well, he's, he's, he's the senior director of, of, um, of our developer network inside Autodesk and he's soon okay. to be soon to be retiring actually but he he um was the person I was reporting to at the time and I became a, a senior manager with a worldwide responsibility and then moving back to Switzerland was straightforward to to justify at that point um so that's what we did uh, I moved back in 2006 and I was th at that point having managed a team in the Americas and a team in Asia. I was now managing, you know, twenty to thirty people in a you know worldwide. So I then had teams um, all over the place, which was really fun. Um, so you know, traveling yeah. to Japan and China, mm. etc. Yeah. So that was the trajectory in terms of my offices that the end I ended up working in. And then so by that point, I was back in Switzerland. And we, you know, had a couple more kids, um, and so increasingly less likely to to want to to carry on traveling really so yeah um yeah that's great and, and so you've been you've did this giant loop around the world and yeah. and got back to the place where you really felt like this was the where you wanted to, your roots to be and that's and and just just to speak to your last part there like it's less likely to uproot <laughs> when you're actually putting those roots in and it just sounds like a, a perfect place for you. That's my wife and I were looking for something similar. It was just like we were done with being in L.A. We were just completely done with it. And I, I don't think I've told this story before, but one night it was we were in the midst of selling our house, listing it, doing the photography, staging everything, you know, and, and doing all the things that you do. And I was just like, you know, wondering, am I actually making the right decision? I'm just just I need to do a, a check here because I think once you kind of make a choice and then you start getting the snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it's like you're less likely to, to do a check and, and see because because you're already on the path. And so I, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to just I walked outside at midnight into this beautiful backyard landscape that we had just completed to enjoy. You know, it was right after COVID and it was one of those things where it's like we did this project so that we could enjoy our space in the backyard and built this wonderful deck and a, a fire pit and outdoor dining and all this. And I sat there and I was, I just was like contemplating this. And then I heard the helicopters and I heard the traffic and I heard sirens and I heard the train and I heard like all of these, just the noise pollution alone. It was so convincing to me at that moment that I was absolutely making the right choice because we hadn't even decided really where we were going to end up, but we knew it had to be different than this. And I think coming up as a designer in architecture, I work with clients throughout the decades who always wanted something that was the complete opposite of what they had. They didn't know what that was, but they knew it wasn't what they had. And so if they had a room with no windows, they wanted a room that was all glass. If they wanted, if they had a room with a low ceiling, they wanted a really high ceiling. And that was how I felt in that moment. It was like, I know I don't want this. I knew I wanted to get more connected to nature. I wanted to be close to trails. I wanted clean air. I knew I wanted no noise. I wanted dark skies, all of these things. And so we, we had an idea of where we were going, but it was that moment that like really sealed it for me. And I think that that is such interesting kind of things that we have to also juggle in our professional lives, right? To is, is the family, the roots where you're going to put your roots down. And there's all of these parts of us that are a part of that equation and fig and navigating all that like there's no playbook for any of that so I, i'm appreciative to you for telling this story because i think it is a is a big part of what everybody deals with and even though this is a podcast about tech and aec like we have to acknowledge that there's these other things out there and I mean, a big reason why I do this podcast is because when I was starting a digital practice at a firm that only had IT up to that point, I mean, there was no playbook. And that's why 
I've done this, right? It's like to give people the tools to not only just hear about how other people are dealing with things, but how to implement things. But also now I think I'm very interested in in broadening the reach of the types of information and stories that we tell on this podcast to make it more whole. I mean, that to me is... And so I, I appreciate you telling that story because it, it was uh, it was a beautiful story, and I'm I'm really jealous of where you are. I mean, I, I've I've seen the Alps, right? Like I've seen your skiing trips that you've posted a couple of pictures of here and there, and it's just it's an incredible, incredible location, and I can see why you were so drawn to it. Yeah, I mean, it's been it is a lovely place to live, and it's uh, and it has to be said that I you know, and I got, I I got some advice. And again, from Jim, so Jim Quancy, he gave gave some interesting advice quite early on in my career. And that's, you know, which I've kind of, well, taken to heart to some degree, but he sort of says, you know, figure out where you want to live in the world and move there. Mm -hmm. You know, don't worry Mm -hmm. about work. Don't worry about whatever else, you know, just, you know, that, that stuff takes care of itself. And I think that's increasingly true now, right? In, in the, in the sort of more online post COVID world that, yeah. You can find a way. Um, I think that, that is environment is really important. The story that you started with, and like you would get on the phone and you would talk to the software support. Right, there was no internet when you were yep. trying to figure out how to push the limits of the CAD package. Right, and now look where we are. Right over the that twenty five years, it's absolutely incredible. And to your point, I, I think. A lot of times we we flip that. We say we have to have that figured out before we go or else we can't go. And the advice that was given to you was go and the other stuff will fall into place. I think that yeah. that's a that's a a nice perspective to have and it's it runs antithetical to what a lot of people think or hear from from the people they're asking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This episode is made possible with support from Avail. In a world where precision meets creativity, Where every line drawn holds the power to innovate, people like you are shaping the future. But let's face it, in the realm of design, the unknown is your least favorite companion. You've been stranded on the island of inefficient software, lost in the fog of endless searching for the right content. It's time to embark on a new journey, a journey to clarity, efficiency, and design excellence. It's time to get off that island and away from the unknown. Introducing Avail, the beacon in your design odyssey. Say goodbye to the daunting 10 to 20 minutes wasted per search, the costly interruptions in your creative flow. With Avail, your team will zip through content discovery, focusing more on designing and less on searching. Imagine a world where you can stop constantly fighting the costly fires caused by pulling content from past projects, building from scratch, or relying on personal libraries. Avail isn't just a tool, it's a revolution for AECO firms. Organize, manage, and navigate your project information with a leader that's proven in reliability, relatability, and success. Join the ranks of the top AECO firms who've already chosen Avail. In just 30 days, you could deploy Avail and witness a dramatic reduction in costly design errors. Whether it's your first CMS or you're considering a switch, there's someone you should meet. Will Rouse, your guide to all things Avail. Schedule an appointment and explore Avail's capabilities, onboarding programs, and professional services. Don't let your designs be clouded by inefficiency. Clear skies are just a click away. Go to getavail.com slash stranded and book a meeting with Will to start your Avail journey today. Avail, where your best design is just a search away. My thanks to Avail for supporting this episode of the Troxel Podcast. And now let's get back to the conversation. So you have no regrets about moving to Oregon? Well, it's only been a year, right? But but no, in this year, it's it's been incredible. And incredible from a sense of, like, I can't see my neighbors. And, and not that I, like, my wife is much more private than I am. I have a, a podcast that goes out to a, a global audience, right? And so, but but at the same time, it's like, we have our space and we have the dark skies and we don't have the noise pollution and we have amazing air quality. And I like to go mountain bike riding and I have incredible world-class trails here. So, um, it's just been, it's been a, an amazing experience so far. And I'm proud to call myself an Oregonian. And it, what's, what's funny is there's a lot of 
ex-Californians here. And so I don't feel too out of place because we thought, you know, what's that going to be like? There's definitely places in the U.S. that are like, go home, Californians, stop ruining our state. And it's, it, I would say like 95% of the people that I talk to who have been here for a while now came from California. So oh, really? interesting. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of ex-Californians here. Yeah. So just within Autodesk, I know a number of people who have, you know, moved up from San Francisco to or the Bay Area mm. generally to, yeah, yeah. to you know, Portland, we have a big office there now. So, and right. even before then, you know, when we had an office in Tualatin, that was where or Lake Oswego after that, you know, we, the people would, would, off, would often sort of go up there for the quality of life um, mm, perspective mm -hmm. and to just get, yeah. you know, bigger place, but also just be, as you say, connected to nature in that way. Yeah. I've interviewed Gabe Paez, who is out of Portland, who was on mm -hmm. the XR team and obviously was the founder of the wild and, um, and there's actually an Autodesk podcast host. He lives here. And so we've gotten oh, really? together a couple of times too, which is fantastic. So uh, it, it it is interesting to build, to be able to build your network internationally, but then still find these close relationships happening because of that, that it, it's just like kind of reversed funnel, right? It's, it's, it's yeah. really interesting. Eve, one of my old students, when I used to teach at the university in Southern California, lives less than a mile away from me. He's an architect, right? And it's like, how how did that happen? Like, we we found each other on Instagram. He posted a photo. I'm like, that looks like this valley. And he's like, it is. Where are you? And <laughs> and it was, it's just one of those serendipitous things that I I find that so interesting how how those things happen. I, I have no idea how they happen, but it's so interesting that they do. Yeah. No, it's really interesting. I think there is that aspect of the, you know, being connected more globally of course is just sort of surfacing these local connections that are yeah. that prove to be really valuable that you wouldn't otherwise right. know so let's talk about what you're doing now and and i know i've got to attend your uh, class on voxels and minecraft uh, those mm -hmm. were kind of the big the big uh, topics that or i'll just say those were the kind of the defining characteristics of of your talk and you're working a lot with I, I, what I would see is like you get to play around. That's what it seems like to me. <laughs> so you're you're doing things that are categorized under research, but I think you're you're having the time of your life playing around. So maybe you can definitely explain it a lot better than I can. But but I think it's kind of fascinating the types of projects that you get to work on within Autodesk. So take it from there and, and tell us kind of what what's been going on in your world. Yeah. So it's an interesting, and even that's a bit of progression. So sort of. Um, it, you know, back when, and actually it's, it's interesting. A lot of the explorations that I've done over the years have ended, ended up being driven by the blog, which is, which is, which was interesting. So when, when I first started it, so that was, and actually it sort of connects quite well with the story of how we ended up in Switzerland. And around mm. that time, as I said, I'd become kind of a senior manager within the developer network team. And we mm -hmm. were exploring ways to um, grow the developer network and to give people better information. And one of the things that came up in a brainstorming was the idea of starting a developer blog. You know, so back at that time, I think there was a couple of Autodesk blogs, maybe Sean Hurley had started Between the Lines and he, another Oregonian. Um, so mm -hmm. he, he yep. had started Between the Lines and it was proven to be super uh, successful with our, with our user base and our customers. And so we said, well, we're not sure that there's enough of a, a, a market or interest for us to start a developer blog, but let's look at starting one that's based on, auto, you know, developing with AutoCAD. With, and, the, the, and at the time, the .NET interface to AutoCAD was under-documented and was super interesting and powerful, but there just wasn't enough information about how to use it. So we said, well, let's, let's try this. And I've actually volunteered to do so because I love to write and I'd already had some... Um, experience of blogging when I was in India. Uh, I actually did an internal blog about my living in India and and the challenges that we had while we were there. That was, I used to get a lot of really fun feedback from the sort of Indian community in the Bay Area, particularly. He used to just laugh at my uh, uh, <laughs> fun. Um, right. Yeah. I, actually, that, that is a bit of an anecdote, but I remember at the time, one, one of the fun ones was um, having to get a birth certificate for my son our son who, uh, you know, who, where we, when we wanted to travel for the first time outside of India, um, there was a whole process to follow, um, in order to get it. And you had to go through all these, you know, amazing 
uh, dusty offices inside this sort of, you know, old sort of empire, you know, British empire type uh, building mm. with where, where, you know, you have to go from one office to the next. Um, and th so I created a, a flow chart sort of describing the process, <laughs> but then also the shortcuts you could take and how much it cost in the bribes to, to speed wow. up the process each time. I'd have to dig it out. I have it somewhere. That's um, great. But it was really kind of fun. So it's things like that that I used to post. And so I had some experience blogging and then I thought, well, let's, uh, let's try. And I, and I, and I, so I started blogging in June or July of 2006. Um, it was also for me, having become a senior manager, I was feeling a little bit further away from the technology and also from our customers. So for me, it was a good way to reconnect with the community, which has always been really important to me. Um, and it ended up being quite successful. I mean, I think at some point, you know, obviously the, the whole blogging, the blogosphere from Autodesk blogosphere sort of exploded from 2004 um, onwards. Uh, and I don't know how many blogs there are now, but at one point it was probably the third most visited Autodesk blog. I think it's, it's, it would not be the, as, as, you know, as, as high ranked at this stage because of the shift in content over the years and people still do come for a lot of my old content, but as my job has changed, I end up blogging, um, less about technology and how to sort of use our, our products and APIs and more about my, you know, adventures or what I'm up to. Um, so, you um, have to, you have to keep yeah. it fresh though. You have to keep it interesting for you. <laughs> so yeah. Well, right. If it's, yeah. You, you go through those, through those different shifts in what, what you're interested in putting out there. I, I used to have a YouTube mountain biking channel. I would love to post more videos to that, but it's one of those things where it's just like, I, I think that there is a lot of value in these little side hustles like this, right? Whether yeah. it's sanctioned by the, the mothership or not, because yeah. it, it, it ignites the curiosity in you, which then feeds back into the business ultimately it makes you an interesting person who also you know you you have this direct line with with an audience and yeah. there's there's a feedback loop there which also informs the work that you do i think it's a it's a really cool thing so sorry to derail the, the yeah the no story no but it's really it's really that's a really you know insightful comment i mean i always felt that um you know having this role and then showing a kind of a human face to this sort of what you mm, don't mm -hmm. want to be considered a big faceless corporation, right? But always has the risk mm. of going in that direction, but sort of showing, mm. you know, how, how giving some, a connection point for people, right? I think mm -hmm. that that, that is, that was valuable, but it's very true that having that, having that kind of unofficial feedback loop with people in, out, you know, out, out in the real world, um, is really valuable, you know, getting that validation or the, the, that, you know, just sort of that, that input can, that can feed into what you're doing is really right. important. Um, so, I mean, the blog actually led me to exploring all sorts of technologies over the years, such as things like functional programming, things that were kind of emerging. The Kinect, I used to, you know, I connected in the Kinect um, into AutoCAD quite early on when somebody had hacked it. I only remember in 20, oh, hang on, 2000, I think it must have been 2008, when, when the Kinect came out and very early on, somebody created a little DLL that allowed you to get data from it. So I kind of found a way to host that inside AutoCAD so that you could essentially, essentially use the Kinect cam, um, you know, sensor as a reality capture device, um, but mm. also allow, you know, use it to detect gestures so you could, you know, move your hands through space and draw inside the Auto, Auto, AutoCAD canvas. So that was kind of cool. Um, and then so all sorts of fun experiments like that um, kind of paved my way to getting more connected with the C at the time the CTO's office. Um, and I had a really interesting time when Robert Aish joined the company back in the day. So Robert joined um, to build, uh, at the time we were talking about D Sharp, but it became a design script, which is now obviously part of Dynamo. Um, and this is essentially a language that, are, that allowed you to, you know, create, you know, designs inside, well, now inside Dynamo, but at the time we were trying to integrate it into, inside AutoCAD. So the course of um, about six weeks, I did a very quick prototype with, with Robert just to sort of show the potential for having that kind of language integrated inside a tool like AutoCAD. Um, 
And that led to other opportunities. Like I ended up moving into the AutoCAD team for a while as a software architect, um, which was really fun. Uh, again, mostly, yeah, I was a software architect on on our AutoCAD based verticals that were mostly quite mature. So I, it wasn't like a Frank, I kind of joke about it now in the sense I was a software architect for a number of products that didn't need a software architect. So I was mostly, <laughs> it was mostly about keeping the wheels on the bus when there were changes inside the platform, you know, how, mm, what, how mm -hmm. would things happening inside AutoCAD changes inside AutoCAD impact these, these vertical products. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was very interesting. I enjoyed that time and I continued to do my explorations with the blog until eventually in about 2016, I shifted across into research and that became more of my sort of day job as well. I have a, I have a, a selfish question. When did, what year was it that Auto, AutoCAD came back to the Mac? Because it, it was on the Macintosh very early. Yes. Was it, was it release 12? Maybe that it went away. Maybe it was, it was, it was pretty far back because of, it was like a floating point thing. I remember there was just like, nope, we're not doing that anymore. And, and, and most people were on PCs at that point anyway. Right. right? Especially in, in architecture. I want to say that the, I don't know exactly when AutoCAD chose to, you know, when it, when it drops, when the engineering team drops support for the Mac, but I mean, it might, it probably was a bit before support for DOS was dropped and, and, and it would have been, R13 was like the last version of AutoCAD that I remember that, that was on DOS. And so it would have been R14 was Windows only from then on until, yeah, right. And this is where it gets a bit tricky for me. Um, I can't remember exactly what, I mean, I remember the, the process in 20, I, I'd have to look it up, but I can't remember exactly, but it might've been around uh, 2010 or 11. Um, I was going to say 2013 started. was my guess, but yeah, yeah I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I yeah. honestly, that was just, I don't know why that number sticks out, but I remember when it did, there was, I, I follow, you know, follow Anthony's blog at architosh.com right. and several people who are obviously tr always tracking the Mac and AEC. And I've yeah. always been one of those people as well, but it's right. uh that was a big deal. I mean, and, and it was beautiful. I mean, to have a big 27 inch iMac screen or whatever running uh, a really beautiful looking product AutoCAD that everybody was familiar with on, on the hardware that they wanted to run it on was a, was a big deal yeah. for that to come back. That was Absolutely. Cool. And it was really, I mean, what's interesting about that, was that I was more excited about the sort of re-architecture work that enabled that and the potential mm, that mm. came off that. And I'll sort of tell mm -hmm. you a bit of a, let's do a potted history of the AutoCAD architecture. But um, in, so R13 was, so prior to R13, everything was, was um, yeah, was, was not object-based. It was, you know, a lot of the code was written in C. Um, mm -hmm. It was rewritten, many parts of it were rewritten during the R13 timeframe to make this sort of more flexible object based framework where you could plug in new objects and allow, and you know, external developers could create their own custom objects that effectively extended the, the AutoCAD, um, object set and you could create and, and, and it enabled all these various, um, vertical applications that came on top of, of AutoCAD and the, and the vertical based products. So. Everybody remembers R13 as being the worst release of AutoCAD ever, right? But <laughs> right. For, me, for me, it's it was in many ways the most impactful. Like if we hadn't done it, yeah, right. Autodesk would not exist today. I can say that fairly safely. Yeah, yeah. So it it's, enabled yeah, everything. It's the product, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it just enabled right. all this, this, this growth um, into into new markets. Enabled this whole develop a vibrant developer community around the world to, to, you know, to, to flesh out this ecosystem of products that was so, so important to our customers. Um, so despite the fact it was painful for customers, it was like the, it was, and it might've been executed differently. Quest, you could argue that, you know, sure. it shouldn't have been released when it was, it could have taken a bit longer, but it was super important. And so that was the, one of the refactors. Another one kind of came around the 2000 timeframe when we went from having um, single document AutoCAD to having multiple documents loadable. And so mm -hmm. there was a whole kind of encapsulation process that allowed us to have, um, 
yeah, to unplug. We and it was we even have, had called it DWG unplugged at the time, but unplug the engine that loaded DWG files. Um, although we had to stop because I think we got a cease and desist letter from MTV, if I remember correctly. Because they didn't like the, the <laughs> use of, of that particular That's term. Like, well, yeah, um, people would definitely confuse those two things. I can see so, that. Yeah. DW, DWG <laughs> unplugged. I know, right? Um, became became object DBX, uh, and and so that was. I mean, this AutoCAD, engine. Eric Clapton. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, that. I mean, yeah. it's just so right. so so surreal. But you know, Ridiculous. I mean, that's where the inspiration came from. So what? I can understand nice. what the okay. concerns might have been. <laughs> that was the problem: is you you let that be known that that, that well, inspired probably. you. Yeah. They didn't like well, that. not me personally, but yeah, the product yeah. managers. Anyway, so they renamed it. Um, but anyway, so that was a really another important sort of step in the modularization of AutoCAD was is to have this sort of separate component that could manage DWGs. But then, when we went to the Mac, we had a process that was what what was called at the time the big split, and this was not just the reading and writing of DWG, but all almost all the commands um, that are south of the border in terms of the UX, you know, the UI for it layer, would be encapsulated in a way that could be rebuilt across different platforms. Hmm. And so this was a really arduous process, and they ended up having to go back, they're looking at um, code that, part, you know, code from AutoCAD that existed prior to becoming Windows-centric, because as soon as we went Windows-centric, all wow. this Win32 crud kind of, in, you know, Win32 API calls ended up coming into into the code base. So they had to kind of purify it, essentially, and cleanse it from all these these um, platform-specific API calls. And then, um, but they, then eventually they ended up with this really beautiful code base that could be rebuilt for the Mac, um, could be run headless inside a, a terminal window, on the, on the server wow. to do operations. So it's also driving a lot of the Autodesk platform services or Forge capabilities around design automation. And it could end up being sort of built into a, a package that can be loaded in the browser. So it enabled AutoCAD web as well. So actually- And is that when have, it made it onto the iPad as well? I think so. Well, I, I you know what? I'm not, in terms of the timeline, I think they did have a different version of AutoCAD, they, they definitely had a different version of AutoCAD that was on iOS and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the iPad. Um, right now, I imagine that is using the same code base, but I don't actually know for sure what the, right. what the situation is there. But definitely having this kind of re-architecture has led to support for all these different platforms. And then on each platform, they have their platform-specific UI, you know, UI right. capabilities then call into this core, core code base. Um, so... AutoCAD's become this like super resilient uh, code base over the years. That is, I mean, it's it's you know for me it's quite miraculous that that you know some code <laughs> that right. was written in 1983 uh, is still running inside Chrome or you know whatever inside wow. your. It's incredible to think about how hard it is to change the behavior of the user as well. So you talked about kind of this modularization and the ability to load multiple documents. There's probably still a lot of architects that just draw everything in one file, right? Like mm -hmm. you've got the plans over here, you've got the elevations pulled off of those plans and all the different orientations, and you've got sections off to the right, and you've got the site plan up and to the left, and it's all in one file, right? And, and then they're still operating that way today. I mean, it's in like to, to pry those habits out of their, you, they'll have to, you will have to pry those habits out of their cold dead fingers, right? Because it's just the way that they do things. And this has always been something that I've been super interested in, which is how do you, how do you enable adoption of new features, new tools, new paradigms, new platforms when, the way that I do it works for me. I know it. I'm, it's like my, in some ways, your identity is wrapped up in some of those things because the cost is too high to spend the time to learn the new way or to spend the money or whatever it is. We, we, we have so much tied up in our old files that mm -hmm. we still need to get access to every once in a while and maybe get something out of or go back and revisit, you know, because our projects take so long, um, man, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of nuance and, and 
I don't know, to, to your point, like there's a lot of cruft built up in, in that's just inherent in the system that makes it very difficult to move forward for, for many people. Yeah. And I mean, I see it myself, um, you know, in my day to day work, you know, I mean, I, you know, tools come online and I, I consider myself to be reasonably uh, interested in adopting ways of working and workflows, mm -hmm. but we all mm -hmm. have our habits and I totally yeah. understand that. So I think in it's one of those things where you, and there's probably been studies around this that, you know, I, I, this is by no means, you know, t truth, but it's, but it's the, you know, what I sense is that you kind of have to have this probably order of magnitude improvement in your efficiency to be worth going to that next level, right? It's like, you need some yeah. Yeah. significant change. It can't just be, you know, I don't think it I've can be half the time. Yeah, I've heard exactly. 10x. It needs to be 10 times better to get somebody yeah. to pay attention. And then that first run experience needs to be pretty good, right? If it's, yeah. if it's a terrible first experience, but it's still 10 times better, I, st I don't think it's going to happen, right? It's, yeah. it's one of those things where there's multiple things that all have to be going in the right direction for it to even be a consideration. And it's still easy to kill. I mean, there's, especially early in that journey from one way of doing things to another way of doing things it's very easy to kill yeah yeah no i can i that resonates with my feeling as well about this um and you know and i think that that one thing that i'm happy about over the years is that you know as least as a company we have been able to um maintain a set of products that work for the people who've been with us since the 80s, right? So, mm, you know, I think the yeah. Autocad team's done a really good job at that. Obviously, other products have come online since, and we haven't always kept every product that we've had, but there is a certain sort of core offering um, that remains attractive, and and while having kind of new things come online as well. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I mean, Autocad still, people still use it. And I don't, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I look, I, I don't look at it right? from a user perspective. I look at it more from an, you know, from a, um, an internal or architectural perspective. I'm, I'm very impressed with what that team has pulled off over the years. I mean, it's, it's, it's similar in some ways to Microsoft Office and what, what that team has been able to do, which is something quite similar around sort of refactoring their code base so that it can run across platforms and then just keeping up-to-date mobile technology, um, various other, I mean, Microsoft is amazing what they've done with, you know, the, the sort of 365 co-pilot stuff as well and, and mm -hmm. how they're integrating mm -hmm. AI. Um, it's, it's really an amazing company, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm anyway, so ha hats off to the, to the AutoCAD team yeah. for that at least. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So now you're working at the class that I got to, uh, attend at AU, you right. were talking about Minecraft and voxels. And I thought that there was a lot of really interesting opportunities there. Um, and and yeah. the, the thing that I mentioned after I attended to you when we caught each other in the hall was this idea of kind of the intersection of VR, XR with the work that you're doing as a possibility for wayfinding inside of buildings because the example that you were showing was like path of travel using voxels yeah. to kind of determine path of travel through three-dimensional space in a digital environment and mapping a path of travel and then being able to see it in, in space, you know, on the computer. And then I was thinking, oh man, how great is it to have an AR headset or something where then that path could be transferred to my eyes and I could yeah. follow it to get somewhere. You know, I could see, I used to do a lot of work with schools and, and if you have an orientation for a student, it's like, where is the office that I need to get to in building 18F that's in some basement, you know, who knows where that is, right? And And it just seems to me like there's a lot of interesting applications to the research that you're doing there and and it's funny because you're tying it back to Minecraft, which I have a 17-year-old yeah. who loves Minecraft, loves it. Like, and talks about the nuance of Minecraft, and it's lost, completely lost on me because of I don't, I don't follow it. But at the same time, it's this incredible environment to make things, right? For and and that's what I love about it on his behalf is that he's actually making things 
on the computer, not just consuming and not just playing. He is doing it through play, which I think is an important aspect, but but he's, it's it's a creation engine, right? And I think that that's what we're doing as architects as well. We're we're building these digital environments and and now you're looking at kind of an intersection of game play slash building environment, right? Which is based on cubes and the work that architects are doing and, and how those merge. I was really intrigued with your talk and I, I would love it if you would kind of take the opportunity to give an overview of what you were talking about. No, absolutely. So yes, I mean, the the, the, the class is really around a um, toolkit that we've built inside Autodesk Research called VASA, which is a you know, voxel-based architectural space analysis. Um, so it's really, a th and, and think of it as a toolkit um, and it's inside Dynamo, but we also have sort of, you know, versions that we run separately as well, where you can take a sort of 3D geometry, break it up into, into cubes, and it, it will analyze, you know, the, the space, not necessarily cubes, actually the voxels are often like long and thin for whatever, for reasons, but that you can look at that, the, for people who are interested, the, the, my AU talk explains a little bit more about this. Um, but effectively, um, this toolkit will break up a building model and allow you to run certain spatial operations to understand how, uh, well, human-centric it is. And I'll talk a little bit about that term, I suppose, when yeah. we see that term as well. Um, but yes, how, how easy it is for somebody to get from one place to another, um, how, how much daylight they can get because they happen to have proximity to a window, um, what you know, we can start to, to, to analyze the space and to, to make sense of it and see how well adapted it is for its occupants. Um, and because so that was really it's voxels, it's inherently 3D, right? And I think yeah. I just want to put this out there early is that yeah. a lot of the things that you're talking about, we are traditionally used to looking at in 2D representation, right? Daylight analyses, views, right? We're talking about isovis and, exactly. and, and path yeah. of travel. All of these things are usually on a set of PDFs or as yep. imagery that we look at in 2D, but but the, the bridge that you're building here here is really taking that into the 3D environment. Yeah, that that's right. And and actually, the original sort of work that was done before Vasa what was in 2D. So we we had a 2D version of it called Space Analysis, and it had those same mm -hmm. capabilities. One one of the interesting things about Space Analysis is that and Vasa as well. And it's really based on this idea of sort of discretizing a space, you know, breaking it up either into a grid in 2D or into a, mm -hmm. vo you know, a voxel grid in, in 3D. Um, and then, you know, performing operations on those. So there are definitely kind of, you, you could do the same thing using more geometric approaches like ray, ray you know, um, so that typically you do ray tracing or ray casting to mm -hmm. to check visibility for an isovist you know so you draw a line infinite line in a certain direction and then you check to see whether it hits anything um whereas breaking it up into a grid will allow you to have much more predictable performance um for that particular resolution especially if you're doing repeated operations so that's one thing that we found with this 2d space analysis package um so it's reese goldstein my colleague in toronto who, who was really the mastermind behind both space analysis and vasa but having done this work for space analysis, um, he really wanted to explore the third dimension and to see whether it was possible to do something similar for 3D, which is what led mm. to led to Vasa. Um, but yes, it, having that capability in 3D mm. and able to work on pretty much any um, model, we we you know we very often just load STL files in to 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 work with and test it. Though. We, Obviously, we can get the geometry more directly from Revit or, or Dynamo, um, but that's a uh, yeah. It just can can break it up, and then you can start to do these analyses. And what's very interesting there is that that resolution slider um, or that trade off between accuracy and performance is really, you know, it's up to you. If you want to do a really mm -hmm. coarse voxel model, which is super quick to to analyze. But the results aren't going to be quite as good because you're, you know, it's it's the approximation is is poor. Um, then you can, but if you want to, you know, dial up the precision and wait a bit longer because it's going to take a bit longer to calculate, then you can absolutely do that. So it's that kind of you have that um, real 
freedom to choose what makes most sense? Do you want to just do something very quickly just to give an indication of how it works or do you need to take a bit longer and do it with much greater accuracy? And, and so this that, kind that of visualization really tool gives you the ability to really understand three-dimensional environments and daylighting as an example, right? If you had, I think you showed a tree in a courtyard and we were looking at maybe where, what rooms I could see it from. And it's not just like in 2D, that would be like a trunk and a, and a canopy line maybe, but, but in 3D, it's the actual shape of the tree, right? So you yeah. can, you can see what you can see, you can understand what you can see from all these different locations. And you had the example of path of travel and you could actually tr use it to traverse stairs, for example, right. which is exactly. very different than what I could understand in 2D. So I think that, that that's kind of an interesting point about what the voxelization is enabling the designer to do is just better understand what's happening in their project when it comes to these different kinds of studies. Absolutely. And yeah, so, so the fact you can go, you can go up and down stairs um, because of the, you know, the, the way that the voxels work and you check the adjacency, but it can sort of go up a little bit. So you mm. can actually sort of map how somebody would walk. It, you know, it works a lot less well with elevators, of course, because that's, that's like, you know, that's harder, but you can build in the logic to sort of manage that. Um, but yeah, so back to your question about the path of travel and sort of connecting with, with XR. I mean, I absolutely think that, you know, I was always, you know, back when the HoloLens came out, I was quite lucky enough to be able to, to get one quite early on of the, 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 ver the first version of the HoloLens. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was really in, intrigued about this possibility of within, you know, uh, some sort of XR device, in this case, the HoloLens, you could, you know, you could be given a path to try to, to walk through a space. Um, and so at the time I'd sort of, you know, kind of, I, there was no, I had hadn't, didn't do any kind of automatic pathfinding, but I just drew the path inside an AutoCAD model, um, created the capability inside to AutoCAD to send that across to the HoloLens um, device. And then you would literally just see this sort of path snaking through the space and you would travel, you know, walk along that path. And what was kind of interesting is that because it's right there, you, even if there was smoke or something in the way, like right. if there was a, an accident, you could follow the path mm. anyway. Right. And also had the device built in this sort of additional capability because there is this like local scanning done by the HoloLens device. So it also, I also built in this sort of fairly rudimentary capability of sort of rerouting locally around obstacles. So if somebody had, you know, something had fallen inside the space right, and you right. couldn't get through, it would kind of try and go around it and it would kind of, you know, see whether it could. So it was kind of, it's kind of, interesting for me it was absolutely um compelling in the sense that if you can imagine this sort of centralized path planning capability maybe using vasa or something somewhere um on a server in the cloud or wherever um but then you know and then having this sort of more local capability to manage uh, local conditions uh i think there's definitely an opportunity to do something around xr particularly around you know emergency egress and uh you know yeah sort of emergency services right. i can well imagine there being some really interesting potential around that in the future but yeah and so just to have this totally device in my pocket that i could pull out and and use as an augmented reality device or maybe it's paired with a with a headset or something to to yeah. cue me via voice or you know some kind of a cueing system that built into it because if you can't see yeah maybe you need to hear it or maybe there's you know i could just see i also can see a lot of applications in emergency situations but also like in orientation situations when right this episode is made possible with support from confluence picture this October 2019, Lexington, Kentucky, the birthplace of Confluence, a place where tech leaders, AEC product developers, and practitioners came together for three transformative days. It was more than a conference. It was a confluence of ideas, discussions, and unforgettable social experiences. Since then, over 200 attendees have experienced the magic of Confluence. I've had the privilege of being part of three of these remarkable gatherings, two in Kentucky and one in Orange County each one a melting pot of learning, collaboration, and camaraderie around a topic shaping our industry. 
And now we're thrilled to announce the next regional confluence event in April 2024 in the vibrant heart of New York City. This time, we dive deep into the realms of AI and machine learning, unraveling their mysteries and potentials in our industry. Are you interested in being part of this exciting journey to continue the conversation to shape the future? Visit the link in the show notes for more details. Confluence, where ideas flow, connections form, and the future of AEC technology is shaped one conversation at a time. My thanks to Confluence for supporting this episode of the Troxel podcast. And now let's get back to the conversation. So, but, you know, just to sort of be clear, the, you know, the purpose for building Vasa in the first place is much more around just sort of assessing the quality of designs and how, once again, sort of using mm-hmm. that as a, as, a, as a tool for us to assess how well-suited um, designs will be for their future occupants. So that's, which is, which kind of ties into my current main focus in terms of the area of research, which is around human centric building design. So how do we, um, how do we capture the human experience inside the the built environment? How, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can try and distill it down. We can try and, um, you know, we can try and build measures or metrics around how we expect people will experience a space and how do we give those insights to design you know building designers and architects during the design process to sort of say right these design changes you're making are going to influence the the well-being of the people who eventually use the 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 space whether you know positively or negatively uh, and help guide them through that in terms of you know is there enough space in here for plants you know are there is there enough space for is, you know, socialization between people. Are you going to, mm-hmm. you know, have these interactions between people that are positive and that are good for their, you know, well, good for the productivity of the company, but good for the, you know, their personal well-being as well? Because we're social and animals, those, right? So those kinds of metrics being informed by real people who can have those experiences during the design process to help the designer make decisions during the design process that ultimately serve. The purpose. I think that's a huge shift that's happened in AEC technology over the last decade or two, right? Which is tools that used to be used at the end of a process are being incorporated earlier and earlier now to help make decisions along the way. And they're just part of the design process instead of an output at the end. I think that's as a designer myself, I feel like the as these tools come online, it gives the designer superpowers to really show the value of an architect in this case, right? Where I think a lot, a lot of times it's just intuitive. There's things that we've been trained to do. We understand that they will probably work the way that we think they will. And then it's only after the building is delivered that that hypothesis actually gets tested, right? Every building is a prototype is what a lot of people say because it really is. It's got a different site. It's got different environmental conditions. It's got a different user group. The people who are occupying it are different. Uh, It's like all of these things stack up and, and it really is a hypothesis and you can't test it until it's over. Well, that's not really the case anymore. If you're willing to include those people in the design process, which does change the design process, right? And and it does change the way we approach delivering projects, which sometimes is set in stone. (laughs) You know, it's hard to change those kinds of things because our contracts are structured a certain way and our interactions are on these certain, you know, milestones on a calendar. But but this real-time feedback mechanism with software and hardware enabled is really incredible if we're willing to harness those things to really, I guess, just really harness them and, and, and affect the outcome in, in different ways that, that we've never been able to do before. I think it's absolutely fascinating, uh, new tools in the toolbox enabling us to do that. No, absolutely. And it's really, it is really exciting because I think, and it's kind of, in some ways, it's a bit like what happened with with software development in the sense we used to, with the waterfall method, we always used to sort of have these big projects and you deliver it at the end, give it to a customer and say, hey, what do you think? And they'd be like, uh, well, not really what I expected. Yeah. Um, but now, of course, with more, you know, now for the last 20, 30 years, I don't even know how long it's been, but, you know, effectively using agile processes where you engage much more with the with the customer along the way and you iterate. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's mm-hmm. a little bit harder when you're talking about a physical 
in environment, but things like XR, things like, you know, getting that participant feedback and allowing them to play a role in the, you know, in the design process is, is going to be is super valuable. And I see it just become really, really compelling as, as technology evolves. And, and use, just using it as a method of communicating those ideas to somebody who can understand them in a much better way than they can yeah. a traditional method of like looking at a 2D plan and not knowing how to read a 2D plan, right? I can't tell you how many times I've sat with a client where they, they sign off on something on a 2D plan and then it, it happens in, in 3D or it actually gets built depending on the process. And they're like, whoa, that is not what I thought. That is yeah. just... They, because they they don't speak that language, and these tools are helping us speak their language, if I mean if we're willing to do that, right? And so renderings served that purpose for a long time, but renderings were so curated, right? We're going to do this angle, we have this field of view, we have perfect materials, perfect lighting, perfect reflections, and the real world is not perfect, and it could change on an hourly basis the lighting, and it could change air quality and acoustics and there's a, so many different things that affect how somebody experiences something in the real world that we can now potentially plug into these models earlier on and say this is what we're talking this is actually what we're this is what your experience this is as close as we can get to mm -hmm. to the real world experience before it's done before we've spent all the money and it's that's an incredible uh, process to go through with, with a client and to let them look around where they want to look and to experience things and, and watch them experience it actually be in the room when they're experiencing it because so much is communicated over facial expressions and body language and like you don't send this stuff over email like you sit in the room with them <laughs> right mm -hmm. and you experience it with them to get their real-time feedback on many different levels not just after they've convinced themselves that it will be okay kind of a thing, yeah. right? It's uh, that, that just visceral um, connection that you can have as an architect with a client. I, I keep going to that because that's my experience and that's what I'm most interested in. But I think that there's, there's an amazing application possibility here for these tools. And, and to your point, it's early days, right? Like this is mm -hmm. the convergence of these different pieces of technology. It's, it's still early days, right? And, and but I think it's it's an incredibly important piece of research to be doing because it it actually makes potential outcomes so much more impactful for the people who actually pay for these services and these these buildings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it sort of makes me think a little bit. You know, we were talking about XR earlier and um, the potential for that. I mean, I remember when the first time I used Google Earth VR, right? So you could, it was kind of cool. You were, you were kind of like in this, you, you were huge. You, you weren't, you know, human scale. You were like Godzilla or something. And yeah. but you, you well, know, my, walking through my space. son, my same son, he's also obsessed with Godzilla. And we did that. We had the HTC Vive and the, and yeah. you know, there was, there was, what was it? Tilt brush and you could draw right. and you, you could do all this. But then there was Google earth that you could f actually go in and, change the scale of and he always shrunk it down because he wanted to be Godzilla and he wanted to walk through the streets of San Francisco right I th and it, it is that is an, an amazing experience to be able to have it was unbelievable and then you could like grab the sun and drag it through the sky right, right. to change the time right. of day right. um, and I'm just sort of thinking back to your point about experiencing something under different conditions you know you know you can if you it wasn't in there but you know you could maybe just change the weather as well Make mm -hmm. it gray, gray, gray and miserable, you know. Right. Find a way to to allow people to experience the building from in all sorts of different conditions that otherwise they yeah. wouldn't. Um, and I always, and and on a kind of related note, I always felt the real opportunity around XR in a general sense was this um, this ability to 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 do things together with people rather than, I mean, it's, it, the thing is, you know, again, somewhat um, incongruent. It's, it's this very isolating technology in many ways, right? You put this thing on your face and you sit there. Yeah. But I think the real potential is like, you know, having this shared experience with multiple people, you, you know, perhaps it could be an architect, you know, leading a family through what it's like to be in their new home and just making design changes on the fly as they give, give input. Um, 
you know, but having that kind of shared collaborative experience can all of a sudden take something that is kind of fundamentally isolating to being something that's really empowering and engaging. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, is where I was always very interested by the potential for XR is not this, um, you know, lock me away and let me play uh, on my own on some video game for, for 10 hours, but more like how do you sort of flip it around and make it this, this compelling uh, experience? And I think that is, again, what, you know, I'm sure Gabe and his team is focused on and others as well. And so we're seeing sorts of technology coming out. Uh, you know, from Apple and others, it's really exciting. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I think there's lots of, lots of reasons to be optimistic that, uh, technology is, is, uh, looking to make certain things easier. I would, I would say. Yeah. yeah. So with Vasa, what is, is that available for people to actually give it a try, to use it, to see how it works? And maybe you can explain where people can go to see examples and, and yeah. get the code and, and run it. I think the probably, so so it, inside the Dynamo package manager, you can just sort of get it and download it. And I haven't tried it with Forma, but now that there's Dynamo for Forma, you should be able to use it there too, as nice. probably with Civil 3D as well. Not that I've tried that. But, um, definitely Dynamo for Revit. You can just... Um, you know, download it in the, in the package manager. Um, it's probably worth going, the best source of information for it at the moment is probably my blog. So if you go to keanw.com slash Vasa, V-A-S-A, then that's, you'll find all the posts that, that I've posted related to that over, okay. over the years, including um, some introductory videos from Reese that really explains exactly what's going on under the hood and you know, why it works the way it does. Um, I think that's probably a good, a good place to start. I'll put a link to that in the show notes for the episode, but could you give a kind of super short truncated version of your class to just explain what, what it's actually like to use it? Because I think we've talked about it and maybe some of the potential use cases, but just give us an, uh, a foundation of what what you the user who might look at this toolkit and use it yeah. would experience as they as they run through it for the first time. Sure. So 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 typically, um, I mean, it is some. It's it's not a. Probably it's worth pointing out that this is not a, a product as such. It's kind of like a a library of of functions, you know, that that exists somewhere in a DLL or whatever. But ultimately, in Dynamo it's surfaced as a set of nodes. So you drag your nodes across into the in, into your graph and connect them. And you'll have some processes where you might take, for example, import an STL file and it'll create a voxel model of that STL file. And then from that voxel model, you've got various operations that you can perform to then analyze that, that voxel model. Um, and then ultimately, at some point down the line, once you've done your various operations, and these operations can be chained together, right? In the sense that what's very interesting about Vassar is they've got a very unif we've got a very unified approach to um, creating analyses. So whether it's daylight or uh, visibility or pathfinding, the output of each analysis is actually another voxel model. And so mm -hmm. that voxel model could represent the path of voxels that go through a space. It could represent the sh the shadow that's created by something, or it could create, you know, decide what what you're able to see. But each of those is because it's a, this uniform format. The inputs are a voxel model, the output is a voxel model. You can start to chain together these operations in interesting ways. So you could, for example, analyze uh, a space and do some sort of shortest path analysis, but also figure out not just the shortest path but the one that has the most sunlight or the one that has the most shade mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. you can start mm -hmm. to think about how these these analyses can work together and then eventually you will have you know from your voxel model you'll choose to visualize it in some way at some point so you can turn on you know you could overlay the path that was a set you know create uh, found between two points in the in the overall model you can then display that voxel model in the context of the original model, for example, so that you could see that path um, with a certain color going through the 3D environment. I'd, so was that, 
clear yeah, enough? Was that? I think that that. <laughs> Well, I think I think it helps to have the visual as well. Yeah. But I think I think if if somebody sets up their screen and they they listen to the podcast at the same time, they can they can figure that out. I think what makes this so interesting, Ken, is that you can then start to think about what parameters you would want to plug into spaces to set up different constraints for the analysis engine. And and I'm just thinking as a designer, like maybe there's a an energy parameter of like the kinds of spaces and the types of energy or the types of uses that they would have. And so for this kind of experience, it would choose this kind of a path. And for a more private or a more quiet experience, it might choose a different path for me to get from here to there. I think that there's a lot of interesting potential, again, to kind of change the what we put into our models as far as metadata goes, because it starts to inform the things we're interested in studying along the way throughout the design process that don't necess- haven't inherently been in the system before, right? It's like, I'm sure that there's been some instances of that kind of a thing, you know, like healthcare design with paint color and how it affects mental health. And there's definitely things like that that we could always tag. But now to actually bring that back into kind of an analysis engine that's that we can just continually monitor throughout the design process and and get updates and maybe get get scorecards back or dashboards or just test it against an actual user to say like is this is this actually working is this telling mm-hmm. us what we think it's telling us i think that there's some interesting potential there to yeah. tweak the design process for better outcomes yeah, I, I and I think this, and I don't know if this is really speaking to the same point, but I'm really interested by this idea of sort of following through on design intent and sort of understanding mm. whether it really, you know, it does, yeah. is the design go either going to, you know, do, do you anticipate via simulation that this design is going to meet the design intent, or right. once it's actually been kind of realized using sensors, using computer vision, doing whatever it. You know, can you show that that design intent was met in the real world? So I think having these Damn. sort of feedback loops it was was, yeah. you know, is really super interesting. And I think that sort of um, capturing that in some way along the way, because at the moment we don't, right? We just have you know you you model your space, but and you 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 we may be able to infer some intent from the route the sequence of operations or the way it's been done or, or whatever, but it's not, it's never really made kind of explicit. Yeah. Um, and that's when you think about it in the context of something like ChatGPT, where it's a dialogue, right? And you're sort of saying, layering in information and you're sort of requesting um, additional, you know, you've got this sort of history of requests and the intent is kind of there as a dialogue. I think that that's really an interesting way that eventually over time, we're going to be capturing of the essence of what in, what is intended and then being able to come back and yeah valid you know figure out whether whether it was met in some way and back to your point of like this human layer of interaction and the validation that can occur throughout the design process and how that can include the end users or you know there's so many layers to to who the end user might be but but actually plugging them into the process of what it takes not only to design this building, but get what they want out of it and make them a part of the design process rather than the the traditional black box design process, which is like, I'm going to go work over here in my office and then, and then I will present it to you when I'm ready. And then I will come back and I will make some changes and I will, but to do that kind of out in the open, Right to do that transparently with them included creates a completely different experience for them along the way from nothing to the actual building. I think that that human part of it, those stories are what is going to live on beyond mm-hmm. me working on this project to me working on the next project, which is a completely different set of users. Like those stories get to proliferate and and again kind of strengthen the story of what we do as an industry that actually serves people at, at yeah. the very, like the end of the day, that's what this is all about. Right. And yeah. that to me, the, the, these tools give us 
the ability to do that even better and to yeah. really show the value of what it is that the AEC industry actually delivers when it comes to an architectural experience or, or different types of experiences that must be met. Like that validation feedback loop that can actually happen throughout the process is, is incredibly important and empowering as a, yeah. to, to fulfill the mission of this, this project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't, did we, were you able to come by our, um, our booth at AU? We I were in the far end, so we were kind of tucked away, but we had, um, we had a stand called, um, from steps to stories. Okay. So this is, it's actually, um, a project that we, so we wanted to, to sort of showcase some work we did with, um, a, an organization in Toronto called the Bentway. So I don't know if you're familiar with the city with, there's a, the Gardner Expressway goes through downtown Toronto and the, the sort of city of Toronto has redeveloped a lot of parkland space underneath this raised expressway and we're sort of repurposing it to make it more of a, this sort of engaging community space. Um, so, well, we've been talking to the Bentway for many years and we saw this opportunity to sort of go in and try and effectively capture the human experience um, in this space. Mm. So we kind of, it looked a little bit, you know, funny, but, you know, basically took a construction helmet, put a 360 uh, uh, GoPro, 360 degree GoPro video camera um, on top. We had a boom with a selfie camera facing, pointing back at the person's face so we could start to get, you know, capture their, exp their well, their, what, was, what, their, what was on their face, not necessarily what they were feeling, but it give you some clues, right? Um, as well as a number of other sensors, environmental sensors. We had the GPS from the, the GoPro as well. But we also gave them a, a smartphone and every so often we'd ping them with a timer and say, well, now you need to enter how you're feeling. And we sort of wanted to capture also this qualitative data alongside the quantitative data. Okay. So that we could really kind of get a sense for, well, first of all, could we have guessed how they were feeling based on what we could see from their face mm, or mm -hmm. other factors? You know, is there some, some connection there? Um, or, you know, and even, you know, anyway, it's all... You can imagine other sort of types of sensor as well, like with with wearable smartwatches, and you know the whether it's you know heart, heart rate variability, right? Get that right, or or you know galvanic skin response, or who knows what sort of things you could do to indicate stress levels and things. Anyway, we didn't do all that. We just sort of used visual feedback and then asked asked the merit that how they were feeling. But we aggregated this this huge data set into effectively into a. Um, a, an experience where people could go in and navigate this data. So we used uh, computer vision on the video to sort of do what we call a segmentation, of the, the scene. So you could kind of, we could color all the cars, one color, we could color all the trees, another color. So, and then you could actually sort of, sort of look at this uh, map of the, the number of objects at each stage. So you could have kind of scrub through and say, well, I want to find this. I want to look at this part of the experience for this particular participant because they seem to see a lot of trees at that point. I'm curious where they are. Mm -hmm. um, so you could really kind of en enable people to explore this data in a really um, compelling user interface that kind of included the quantitative with the qualitative. Um, and, you know, even, even you could see little speech bubbles with what they were saying at that particular moment because they were talking as well into the, into the smartphone. Um, but again, this way of, so we created this is sort of very interactive um, ex exhibit where you'd ha we had, well, the first one in Toronto, we had like six, six, 50 or 55 or 65 inch screens, you know, placed vertically, but next to each other. And that was this like huge visualization of the space. And you controlled it with a, with a smaller touch screen that would effectively change everything on, on, on those screens. And at AU, we didn't have as much space. So we just had three screens and then the, the smaller touch screen controlling them um but it was a way for people to kind of relive the experience of being in that space or to, or to get insights into how people how people experience the space in, in, yeah. and we tried to get a diverse set of people some who knew the bentway some who didn't um and then you know basically would capture that data in order to uh, at some point in the future you can imagine that data being very useful when redeveloping another area un underneath the bentway or elsewhere um and you know so that was kind of the au exhibit but it's really like it's you know 
looking at ways to um, involve people in the process of sort of understanding how the built environment functions for them. Yeah, right. And and surfacing that in some way with the potential of it influencing the design process. So yeah, I, I think, think that kind of speaks a little bit to what you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. I think that's fascinating. I, I guess maybe we can we can wrap up. I have th this particular point has really led me to want to ask you this last question, which is how important is the research arm of Autodesk? I mean, to you, but also like thinking of it big picture, because what I'm what I'm looking to get insight out of is how important is it for an AEC firm? to have their own version of this as well. And what kinds of things, like you probably have a bigger budget than most AEC firms for, for R and D, but R and D is something that I think should be happening in all of AEC. And I don't, it's not right. I mean, like it's happening in the large firms for sure. Um, the budget number is probably still too small, but how important is it? Like what, I'm sure it's driving value, but I would love to hear it from you. Why, why you think this is so important and, and what people can, could get out of doing R and D. Yeah. So I think, I think there is value in having, you know, the large, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting. I mean, going back far enough, I mean, Autodesk was always a fast follower, right. In terms of our business strategy. It was not necessarily to be the first to break ground or to do mm -hmm. something significant. It was to how can we demo democratize exist, you know, not existing technology, but take you know, stuff that's like a hundred grand and make it available for ten grand, or mm. you know, that same sort of order of magnitude reduction in cost. Um, so it was always about that democratization aspect, and and so I think really that shifted when you know under Carl Bass and Jeff Kowalski was CTO back in the day and they really sort of you know Jeff made the decision to sort of build out this research function we'd, we'd acquired Alias um, in Toronto so we already had this core of researchers that mm. you know served as the kind of seed for us to build out this 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 larger organization um I think it is it's, it's hard for me to put a like a number on how valuable it is, but I think that it's really important for large. I, I think it's really important for small companies that large companies like Autodesk are doing this work mm -hmm. because I just don't think they have the the, the yeah. scope to do it, and You're it's going it on their behalf. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> create. You know, yeah. I mean, I know. I I don't want to. I, it sounds funny to say that, but at some level, yeah. yes. I mean, I think it's 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 the big players. Of course, they have their own bespoke tool set and capabilities and possibly don't have the incentives in place to actually make that better for the industry as a whole whereas you know or it's a self-interest but yes i mean we have that interest to sort mm -hmm. of extend our, our tool set to sort of enable these emerging workflows that otherwise would not be possible for um for smaller companies so i you know i I think I think it's important, you know. I I do think that, that um, we, uh, yeah. So I I don't necessarily think that investing heavily as a small company in some very sort of esoteric researchy type thing that may or may not pay dividends. I don't think smaller companies have the sort of risk tolerance to do that in quite sure. this way. So I will. I wouldn't always rec recommend it. I think that in a general sense, so, I mean, and I would sort of separate this idea of research in the sense that we're looking at from having some programming capability in-house, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is right. increasingly valuable for everybody. You know, I, every, everybody in the industry, I think if you don't have, you know, why not everybody, you know, I, th I think that it's becoming more important for people to have some fluency with, customization and, and programming yeah. technologies and mm -hmm. increasingly it'll extend to the use of AI and having fluency around around that as well. I think those are the things that are really going to allow you to allow smaller companies to stay competitive and um, do 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 more with less, I guess, in that sense. Nimbleness, so I think right? it is yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate that because it isn't available to everybody. Not everybody has the, the resources or the budget to, the, you know, resources could include people or hardware or software or time, right. Uh, to, to chase after that stuff. But it, so, so I appreciate you adding the perspective that the work that you're doing at some level is on behalf of those who are, don't have those resources. And, and so that, that's a really important point to make. I appreciate that. This has been a, a fun conversation. We've gone all over the place <laughs> and we, we've traveled the world. We've traveled through time and it has been, it's been really fun to have. And I, I appreciate you taking the time to tell your story and the story of what you're working on today at Autodesk. And it's, it's been great. I hope people uh, enjoy it as much as I did. So I'll put links to everywhere people can find you on the internet, on LinkedIn, your website, your blog, at the tools that you're working on with Vasa and, uh, and your course at AU. I think it would be great for people to catch up on that as well. Is there anywhere else that you want to point people toward? No, not off the top of my head, but you know, if people want to click connect on LinkedIn or, you know, on, on, you know, I don't post quite as much on X um, as as I might once have, uh, but I do still. You know, all my blog content goes out, goes out through um, through LinkedIn and Twitter or X as well. Uh, but yes, I mean, I just love to hear from people. Um, you know, reach out and get in touch. And thank you for for inviting me. It was a it was a very pleasant surprise. And uh, you know, I, I love what you do, and it's been. It's been a pleasure coming on. Well, thank you very much. And likewise, I, I look forward to, hopefully we can do this again in the future. Yeah, I hope so. Definitely. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Evan.